this is Pat with Pat's Two Cents with God's Church of Love. This is in place of our Saturday service. And I will let most of you know, or all of you know, that um, there will be no service Saturday because I'm riding out to another city to pray for a friend of mine whose husband has fourth stage cancer. So I will be doing that tomorrow. First Timothy chapter three. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality and apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker. That means not going up upside somebody's head. <clears throat> No striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, money, 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 but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. But if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? And not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Likewise must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, <clears throat> not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. Now, let me ask you a question. It's coming to my mind right now. How pure is your conscience? The reason I'm asking is because there are times when you see people in ministry and they're preaching the word and you think everything is fine until they do something a little bizarre and you wonder where did that come from? So I kind of want to warn you about church leaders. Be very careful who you place yourself under. The Lord is bringing to my memory a pastor I watched on YouTube in horror. And this pastor had a young, had a mother bring her daughter up. And he brings the daughter up and he says, I better not find any man trying to molest this young girl. And it sounded so protective and, and, and so nurturing. It was really sounding good, y'all. The congregation was full. Mm -hmm. Parents standing right there next to the daughter. He goes up, he says, and this is what he does. He walks up to her, puts his hand on her shoulder, takes the other hand, and touches her boob. Now, she was developing like an adolescent to teenage right in that age bracket. He said, nobody, I better not catch anybody trying to touch these. Nobody touches these but me. Now, I actually had no plan of talking about this right now. But it's coming to my mind, so I'm going to go with it, y'all. There must be some crazy crap going on in these churches nowadays that I don't even know about, that Lynn doesn't know about, that Pat, Jeanette, Peter, uh, Rashad, uh, Matt, you know, none of us know about. The rest of the group, we don't know about. But God does, y'all. God's looking and he's booking. So think about this. Another video I saw. The same pastor. Now, I couldn't believe that the girl's father didn't knock him flat on his can. I couldn't believe that they just allowed him to feel on their daughter in front of the congregation, making it sound like a holy protective act. He has a woman stand up, step out the aisle, come forward. And he's talking about how uh, he was talking about something. In all honesty, I don't remember what he said. It was what he did that blew me off my chair almost. He walks up to her, puts his hand on her shoulder, and lays his head on her breast and keeps it there while he says whatever he's saying. There's another video I saw where the pastor was being reported on video. He was being recorded and reported by this YouTube uh, channel. And he was being exposed because his, 
<laughs> his requirement for all single ladies is that they all sit on the front row. The front row was open only for the single ladies. And they had to sit there and they were instructed by the pastor, y'all, as a form of purification, believe this or not, to sit there with no underwear. In other words, no panties, no bra. Now, I don't know why I'm getting this message because I thought we were going in a whole different direction with this scripture. But this is just banging in my head right now. Scene after scene after crazy, ridiculous scene. You will be surprised the abominations that are occurring in the churches, within the churches, within church buildings, between the, the ministry, between the pulpit and the pews. You will be shocked at the stuff God sees. You'll be shocked. And what I'm feeling like right now is to share with you, be careful about getting in an office by yourself with your church leaders. Be careful about allowing your teenage kids, your children, be careful about allowing them to go to the pastor to get counsel. Be careful about that. Because while you think that they're there pouring in the Lord, they might be filling them up with something else. And it might be with body parts. You have to be careful. Just because the building says church. Iglesia. Just because it says anything regarding church. Temple. Uh, mosque. Whatever you want to call it. Because some of y'all have different beliefs. So I'm, I'm not debating the belief right now. What I'm talking about is just because it has the title of something you revere does not mean it's of God. It could be straight from hell. It could be anointed by the devil. The leaders of those churches, the leaders of those buildings of faith, your congregations can be so contaminated with the demonic, with lust, with homosexuality, with pedophilia, whatever. It can be so inundated with filth, but because they're good at preaching and they know how to get you all riled up, right? You think it's the anointing. You know, people know how to get you all inspired. Ain't no anointing in it, y'all. You got to know to discern the spirits and try the spirits. You see if they be of God. If they're doing something you know is not of God, and they try to camouflage it with the word, you get your little happy hips up and walk out. Make a public statement. That is not of God. Get your hands off of her breast. Get your head off of her boobs. What are you doing? You a dirty old man. There's nothing about God about that. Jesus never put his hands on a woman's breast or a man's private parts. Come on now, think about how freaky that is. That's off, y'all. Think about that. You, the safest place in the world should be where you go to church. The, the purest place, the most sincere, genuine, uh, clean, atmospheric, I mean, whatever you want to call it, that should be the church. That's a safe haven. That's what it's supposed to be. When the saints gather together, God's people gather together, that should be a place of safety. Now, I heard a pastor years ago, he reprimanded his congregation and let them know if they ever see anybody molesting child, teenager, woman, man, boy, girl, whatever, bring it to him, tell him about it, he'll handle it. But he ain't handling body parts. What he's going to do is discipline. He's going to rebuke, bring correction. Or even make somebody get arrested if it's that bad. But you don't get up there and tell your church you're not going to do this while you're standing right in front of them doing it. You're going to demonstrate to them what they're not going to do. What kind of crap is that? You guys be careful who you get up under. You be careful 
when your pastor, listen to this. I'm going to share an experience I had. And that will make it pretty plain to you about the abominations done in the church. I knew a lady. <clears throat> didn't know her at first. Let's start with the story. Okay. Ah, this is definitely not on my program today. So the Holy Spirit, I guess, is having his way. Oh, wow. <sighs> this is right before I married Milton. I was sitting at the post office in my car. You're going you're gonna to trip when you hear this. It involved dreams and everything else. I was sitting in the car at the post office. Now I'm wide awake. This is reality. And I'm playing some South African music. I love music from Johannesburg. And I just love all that. Zimbabwe and all that. I love South African music. And this is Christian music. They're praising and worshiping God. And an African man walks up to my car and he says, excuse me, I don't mean to interrupt you, but are you from my country? And I said, I have no idea what you're talking about, but I'm from right here. <laughs> he said, well, you're playing music from my country. And I said, yeah. And he said, but that's from my country. I said, yeah. And he was just surprised. I guess he didn't expect to hear an American want to hear his music. And I was like, I love South African music. So we talk, a f you know, at, you know, we talk a few, uh, what is the word? Politities or I can't think of the correct word. Anyway, so we exchange a few little comments back and forth. And then he hands me his business card. He says, my name is Pastor So-and-so. No, I ain't telling you his name. Anyway, so he tells me his name. Then he's, he invites me to come to his church. He said, do you sing? I said, yes. He said, would you like to sing for my church? It's a little tiny church, maybe 15 members. I said, okay. So he gave me the address and he scheduled me to come over and sing. So I came and I sang. I leave. He says, uh, I'm going to give you a call because I want to talk to you about ministry. I said, okay. So I'm thinking, oh, Lord, oh, la, la, I'm getting ready to get some open doors finally to ministry. So he calls and he sets up a time. He wants me to come back, but this time he wants me to bring a word. He wants me to preach the following Sunday. So I'm praying, Lord, give me the word and all that. And all of a sudden I have a dream. I have a dream, y'all. And in this dream, I'm sitting at a table that's surrounded by all these people. It's like the pastor's entourage. All the members of the congregation are sitting around this table. While the pastor's trying to convince me to become one of his wives, y'all. I couldn't believe it. I was like, what? One of your wives, not, not a wife, one of your wives. I was like, whoa, this is bizarre. So as soon as he tried to convince me to become one of his wives, guess what happened? Earthquake. And I'm like, okay, now that was a big earthquake. And one of the women leaned forward and said, oh, that wasn't an earthquake. That was just the volcano. And I'm looking at her like she's an idiot. Volcano? That's worse. I grabbed my keys. <laughs> I'm getting ready to get, you know, get the heck out of Dodge. So um, I said, well, I guess I'll get ready to go. And the pastor tries to, he tries again. He's talking. I don't remember all he said, but he's trying to tell me why I need to become one of his wives. And as soon as he said one of his wives, the, the shaking began again. And I grabbed my keys. I said, well, y'all got to go. And I just went around the table and I'm heading out. Now, there was a woman standing in the door. This was a multicultural, a multiracial church. And the pastor was African. And there was a woman in the door who was Caucasian. And she was like, uh, as the Bible calls it, mincing as you go. She was very uh smug and she was like uh showing off the beauty of her bracelet and she was almost acting like the prima donna of the church and um 
and th there were other ladies sitting around. Some of them were black. There was a couple of white guys there. There was uh it was it was multi everything. So I get up, I'm getting ready to go. I didn't I didn't make the connection till I woke up. So as I, I run out the building, I get ready to get in my car, and there are cinders, burning cinders floating down the side of my door. And I jumped in the car, started it up, and took off. And as I took off to drive out the driveway, I noticed the church was at the base of the volcano. Yes, I said volcano. Yes. All right. This is still the dream. So as I'm pulling out, I'm looking in my rear view, wishing that I said, Lord, let somebody come out of there. Don't let them all stay in there like dummies. And I take off and then I wake up. So, of course, I prayed the prayer. Lord, I knew exactly what it was. I knew it was that church. And I said, Lord, I didn't even see it. When I was singing, all of it looked so innocent. And the pastor seemed so nice and hospitable. So, um, but I knew God was showing me this is what's happening there. So I said, uh, okay, I can't believe that some of those women are his wife, but okay, I guess that's what's happening. You know what I don't know. So, um, but they look so innocent, y'all. When I say they look innocent, the folks in my church look more mischievous than they did. They look like, oh, all they were missing were angel wings and halos. That's how innocent they look. They were sweet. They just seem to be so mellow. Anyway, so when he has me come back to preach, what does the Lord give me for a word? Nothing but words on lust and inordinate affection and sexual promiscuity, perversion, the whole nine yards. And I'm thinking in front of them, oh Lord, am I really hearing from you? Long story short, I bring the word. I share some of my personal, you know, failures, and then I have an altar call, and some of my friends came, so a couple of people I knew hit the altar, but none of their members hit the altar at all, so anyway, I got through, and then I left, and then the next time, he had me back again. I couldn't believe it. It was like maybe two weeks later or three weeks later. Same message. The Lord's got me glued to this message. And I'm like, why? So I get ready to preach. And the pastor gets up. And as he gets up, one of the sisters in the church, they get up. And they both leave right at the time I'm about to preach. And they go to the back. They didn't leave the building. They just went to another part of the building. So I'm preaching. And I had another altar call. Again, nobody from the church came up. Just some of the people I had invited, they answered, but not them. So I was done. And then about two or three weeks later, one of the ladies from that church made an appointment to get their hair done at my salon. So I welcomed them. They were acting very guarded. I want you to hear this. They were acting very guarded. And um, the Lord had thundered that I needed to talk to her. I really needed to talk to her. And I don't delve into people's business like that. And I'm like, Lord, this woman doesn't know me. I'm going to ask her all these questions. Just ask. I'm like, oh, boy. So I start asking questions. And when I see her really freeze up and the wall go up, I said, wait, wait, before you get defensive or offended by my questions because I don't feel comfortable asking either. Let me share this dream with you. And I shared that dream about the volcano and the African pastor trying to talk me into becoming one of his wives. When I got through telling her that story, she raised her hands and started praising God in tongues. And she, uh, the wall came crashing down and she opened her soul up and just poured everything out. The man had multiple women in there that he could go. And she even mentioned when he, when he leaves, he's probably going with a woman. She know, she knew she was his legal wife. She knew how unfaithful 
this man was. But she came from a culture where that was semi-accepted because the men who were unfaithful took care of both their wife and the the extramarital affairs and all the kids knew each other and and they <laughs> and the fathers took care of all the families that they created anyway so uh that's how this man got away with it with her but the woman that was the prima donna was the woman he would check this out y'all he would not live with his wife he was living with a white lady that was in that congregation. She was the only white female. There were two white men, two white males, but she was the only white female. Only reason I'm saying it that way is because that's the way it came to me in the dream. She was the only white female in that group and in this church. The wife told me she was the one he was shacking with and she was pregnant. So I want to share with you that God knows there are things happening in the churches. Now, what the Lord did was when she knew that the Lord had actually sent me to handle her situation, what she did was she asked me to pray for her. We ended up forming a long-term friendship and she left the church. And we, I told her, if you find a church, I will leave mine temporarily and, and stay, stick with you there to help you get rooted until you feel at home. And then I'll go back to my church. So I went with her. The Lord blessed us. We went out to eat. And the Lord, we prayed the Lord would tell her where she should go. And the server invited us both to their service the next morning. And that was her home church. That was it. She loved it. And she divorced the man. And that, the rest is history. My point in telling you this is you may think that everything looks good, sounds good, smells good, quacks good, waddles good, preaches good, sings good, whatever. The building might be beautiful. Everything might be pristine and wonderful. But you be very careful because there are many more wolves in sheep's clothing nowadays in the pulpit many more. And you cannot allow yourself to become so enamored with the so-called man or woman of God that you think that they are incapable of committing sin. Don't even go there. Don't entrust your child to be alone with them. Matter of fact, a lot of y'all need to be careful who you leave your child with in the first place. That's why so many people are being molested, because parents are not paying attention. They're not discerning. They're not scrutinizing. They're not questioning. They just let things happen because they're having fun, and they just want to get rid of the kids. Go on out there and play somewhere. So what I want to say to you is be careful about these churches. You know I've, I've told the story about how the Lord gave me a dream about there being poop in the altar section of a congregation and poop in the pews, piles of poop. That's a very nasty picture of the condition of a lot of these churches. God sees so much filth, so much blasphemy. Here's another thing the Lord sees, and that is included with this poop I'm talking about, because the poop really represents something very nasty, very uh, uh, very abominable. And a lot of things that many of you born-again Christians are involved in now, even the pastors are allowing it. You got tarot card readings. You got witchcraft. You got all kinds of seances and Ouija boards and all kind of new wave with crystals and, and, and sage and white magic and you're you're allowing this crap and it's astrological readings and, and mystical this and mystical that right there my brother and i walked in a church to uh, i just wanted to let him see some of my books to see if he thought he could sell them in the bookstore what it was some special day where all these boots were all over the place 
There was only one that had to do with the Lord. Everything else, they had hypnosis. They had, I couldn't believe it. I said, what kind of crap is this? I was shocked. That's why so many Christians are dabbling in witchcraft, white magic, sage, crystals, all kind, all kind of mess. Because the pastors are naive. Everything goes. You're okay. That's okay. He's okay. She's okay. And that's okay. It's all right. As long as it's warm and fuzzy, it makes you feel good. It's inspiring and uplifting. Guess what? A good high from heroin, from uh, whatever you guys use out there now. You can get some good highs out there, but it's not permanent. And that is the problem with the churches. They're going for these highs, these little temporary highs. Keep the people coming because the more people we keep happy, the more money we gather. We can't say that this is a sin. We can't say that's a sin. We can't make a stand for anything because we don't want to lose members. We don't want to offend. Yeah, you better offend, baby, because if you don't offend people, trust me, it's guaranteed you're going to offend God. If you don't stand for something, you will fall for anything. Again, I admonish all my brothers and sisters in Christ and all of you who are thinking about turning your hearts over to the Lord. Be very careful where you take your membership. Be very careful who you decide your mentor is going to be. Because not everybody has pure, holy, righteous, anointed intentions with God. Amen? I just got to put the warning out. I hadn't planned on going in that direction. But see, this says, it is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desires a good thing. A bishop then must be blameless. Blameless, y'all. You hear what this is? It's talking about character. The husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, good behavior, given the hospitality after. You can't have good behavior one day on Sunday or Saturday, wherever you have your church. And then the rest of the, of the week, you living like, like a, a stanky hoe. I don't care if you're male or female. If you're a stanky hoe, you're a stanky hoe. Own up to it. Repent and stop dragging other people into your mischief. God's watching now. That's all I got to say. God's watching. And you know, when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes. You don't want to think everything is peaceful, safety, uh, safe, and copacetic. And then all of a sudden, the Lord rakes your behind mm -hmm, over the cold. Straighten up and fly right, y'all. Get it together. Or step out of that pulpit. You can't close your legs. Step down out of that pulpit. You can't keep your zipper up. Step down out of that pulpit. I'm not talking about married couples. I'm talking about inordinate affection, illicit desires and acts. Step down out of that pulpit voluntarily. Don't wait for God to have to expose you. I guess it's a word of warning. Hmm. Who knew? God bless you. I'm done. Wow. As uh, as as uh, a Mr. T always said, I pity the fool that thinks he can play with God, male or female. Game over, y'all. Curtain coming down on you. Get out the way.